my uncle Harold Tanikwish used to have a great expression, which is, it's hard to hate someone who you know a lot about. My name is Melissa Tantaquidgen Zobel, and I come from the Mohegan tribe. I serve the tribe as medicine woman and tribal historian, and also as the executive director of the cultural park. Uh, traditionally, the position of a medicine person would have been held by several people. There would have been those who took care of uh, certain extreme illnesses, some who would have been considered prophets, others who would have handled um, various types of spiritual and medicinal matters. Uh, some would have been more herbalists, some would have been more handling ceremonies. Uh, now, because of the size of our group, we only have one person who is technically the medicine person, but we also have pipe carriers who handle some of our spiritual activities. We have lodge keepers who handle the sweat lodge, um, and we have a fire keeper who handles fire ceremonies. So they're all technically medicine people, um, but I have the title, and in our case, it means that I am the keeper of traditions. So my job is really not so much to heal and offer herbal medicine as it is to maintain our stories and our ancient beliefs and our spiritual traditions. I learned uh, this position from my predecessor, who lived from 1899 to 2005. So she had a very long life and she carried many ancient traditions because of her long life. And her predecessors also lived to be about 100 years old. All of our religious and spiritual beliefs are connected to places that we live on. So unlike a lot of the religions in this country um, that many of us practice as well, where the spiritual places are far, far away, our spiritual places are right next door. The United States in, in many individual states did not permit the speaking of Mohegan languages and children were punished for a very long time for speaking them. So in schools around the turn of the 20th century, there were very few people who were still speaking the language. One of them was a woman named Fidelia Fielding. And uh, Fidelia was nervous about passing it on because she didn't want children to be punished. But she did keep diaries. And because our language is very similar to other Algonquin languages, there's an Algonquin language group, and that's what people speak from here through large parts of Canada and the United States. We have been able to reconstruct our language, and so we now teach some of that uh, to our young people. Um, it's very difficult. People only learn a little bit, and, and we're trying to do more with it. Cultures of any kind are hard to maintain. You know, people like to do new things in new generations. But we're very grateful that we have this tribal office, that we have a reservation. We didn't have those things when I was growing up. And that makes us have uh, an easier time in the sense that we have a place where we can share our arts and crafts, where we can share our language, we can bring our children for camp and activities and events. And uh, so we have actually a physical place that we can share our culture. Before that, we had our museum. Tanaquidin Museum was founded in 1931. And Mohegan Church, which was founded in 1831. Those were places where we could share our culture previous to having this government building. Yes. We have many community-wide celebrations, the biggest of which is the one that we share with the outside community. The third week of every August, we have an enormous event called the Wigwam Festival, which is our Thanksgiving for the corn harvest. And that's about 10,000 years old. That's been celebrated for a long time, ever since corn was, was brought into this area. And that's the annual uh, song and dance festival to celebrate corn. Uh, corn in this area traditionally was a flint type corn that had eight rows, kind of almost a beige color more than a yellow or a white. And it's still used, uh, it's still grown by a few farmers. We use it to make a ceremonial food called yokeg, which is dried parched corn, and succotash, which is my favorite, which is corn meat soup. So the Mohican tribe has been in Connecticut since before the Europeans came to this land. But we also have our own migration story, like many tribes. Our stories tell us that we came from the west across a great fresh water, and then we came to upstate New York, and we lived there for some time, or what is now upstate New York. And then we came to Connecticut, which means the land of the Long Tidal River, 
and move to the southeastern area along the shore. So that's our history in ancient times. When the Europeans arrived, our sachem was a man named Uncas, and he decided that the best thing to do for our people would be to come up with some sort of a cooperative alliance with the English. So he made a treaty with the English in 1638, and we have been friends with the state of Connecticut, followed by the United States government since that time. However, our tribe was only federally recognized in 1990. A reservation is a really complex legal entity because it is technically federal land, much like the submarine base is federal land or the Coast Guard Academy is federal land. Um, Indian lands that are taken into trust and become reservations are also federal land. So while tribes have certain authorities there, certain legal authorities such as, um, for, for instance, we have civil jurisdiction, and we have a police force, and we have a fire department. Um, we are also, in some ways, under the federal government. Um, so an Indian reservation is, is a special designation for Native American lands. Not all Native American lands in Connecticut are federal reservations. Many of, uh, there, are, there are five reservations in Connecticut. Two of them are federal and three are states. At the same token, about the same token, Indians are domestic dependent sovereigns. So while reservations are part of the United States, they're not part of the United States. Indian tribes actually have sovereign jurisdiction to, so to various extents on their lands. Some tribes have criminal, some tribes have civil. Here at Mohegan, we have full civil jurisdiction and concurrent federal jurisdiction. Well, you know, the great thing about being a sovereign government and the fact that we have a tribal council and we have tribal elders is that we are able to be different and we are able to have rules that aren't necessarily the same. If we don't like something that's, that's a rule maybe in the United States and it doesn't fit our particular community, we can custom tailor it. Much like a town or a state does, you know, towns and states try and do the same thing. They try and, every state has different rules because we have different, different types of opinions in various states. And the same is true for our government. Uh, the one thing that I think is, is best about a tribal government is because it's small, if you have a concern, you can go and speak to your tribal counselor anytime. So uh, tribal governments were asked from about the 1930s on to try and come up with a form in their government that would help them interact with town, state, and federal governments, federal in particular, which means that tribes were asked to create constitutions. Tribes didn't traditionally have a written form of government. You didn't have a written language. So uh, the constitutions were tricky. It took us a long time to uh, create constitutions that were workable. And the Mohegan constitutions were begun in the 1970s and rewritten and, and fine-tuned. Uh, and right now what we have is we have a system of government with a tribal council, which uh, handles the executive uh, and legislative authority, and a council of elders, which handles the cultural and traditional authority. And they also serve as the judicial branch, so they're like the Supreme Court as well. And those two branches of government, uh, just like in the United States, sometimes disagree as to what their powers are and their authorities. And uh, they may not disagree on, they may disagree also on how to handle various issues, but they keep each other in check and balance. And we don't have a president, we have a chairman, but we also have a traditional chief. So uh, the traditional chief has some authority, just like the chairman has some authority. Her authority is more regarding cultural and traditional matters. The reason we haven't assumed a lot of those jurisdictions is because very few of our members live on the reservation because we have such a small reservation. So it's it's not as um, important for us to have those jurisdictions as it would be safer tribe where everyone lives on the reservation. Uh, we also have something new in our jurisdiction, which we've, we've gone back to traditional peacemaking, uh, which is a function that many tribes have assumed so that some matters don't actually have to go to court. They can go to a circle of peacemakers. Uh, for example, if teenagers get in trouble or families having a domestic dispute, they can bring it before the peacemakers. And we haven't had a lot of use of the peacemaker court yet, it's very new, but it's an alternative to um, more uh, of a punishment type system. You work with the person, both sides trying to figure out a way to make things better. When you grow up on an Indian reservation, you are a dual citizen. You are both a citizen of the United States and a citizen of your reservation. And so. 
um, if you were born at Mohegan, you would be a citizen of both. But you can also be a Mohegan citizen born off the reservation. Well, and it's, it's not just a concern in the West. There are very poor reservations in New England, very, very poor re Indian reservations in New England, federal Indian reservations. Many people don't realize that. Uh, here in Connecticut, we're very fortunate because of our location that because we're so near Boston and New York, we are at, a, at an intersection where we can have a business that people will visit. If you live, say, in a remote area of Maine, you know, you're not going to have people come to a casino or some other business entity because it's too far removed from people who are in large numbers. Um, but because we're in your cities, you know, we're, we are very fortunate in that we can have large casinos and that they can be business developments. Um, so living standards here, however, used to be very poor as well, extremely poor. Um, in my uh, great-grandmother's time, living standards were very, very bad here, and Indian people had a hard time uh, finding work and finding education. And the increase in our living standards as a result of our business enterprises is enormous. Most of our population, of course, did not go to college and did not have much education until this generation. This generation, um, we invest mainly in health and education and, our, and of our, for our community. So if you're a Mohegan tribal child and you want to go to college, we will send you to college. A lot of, a lot of the misconceptions about Native Americans have to do with the fact that uh, people aren't given um, correct information, and sometimes that has to do with the fact that Indian tribes, first of all, are, are very different one from the other. So to learn about Indians as a whole is tricky because there are so many differences with the tribes. Uh, the other thing is that um, U.S. history books as you may well know, were written pre predominantly by white males for a very long time. Um, when I was in graduate school for history, uh, I was the, there was only one other woman, one woman teaching in our department of 40 professors. So, uh, you know, perspectives on U.S. history aren't limited just in terms of Indians. They're limited in terms of gender, too. You know, there's not a lot of good U.S. history about women, just as there's not a lot of good U.S. history about African Americans or Native Americans or many, many, many groups in our country. And I think that's being remedied now. Uh, the key thing to remember about Indians is that we experience something called colonialism just like every indigenous population in the world. And colonialism is when, you know, European powers were expanding and they were expanding their domain and they uh, either brutalized or assumed land from indigenous populations such as in Australia, in Canada, in Latin America, and in the United States. I think that your generation is doing a very good job in pulling back those layers and looking at the real American. And it's an interesting story and it's a messy story, but it's a fascinating one. So I think tribes or reservations are going to continue for a very long time. And I don't see them dissolving because what we are able to do through these um, processes we have and the governments we have are maintain and grow our cultures back. Because of colonialism, which took our cultures down, destroyed our languages, took away some of those things, it's going to take some time for us to build them back. But in the process of building them back, our people are becoming stronger in their own cultures and in their own beliefs. And what I think will happen is that uh, our country is, many, many people used to call it a melting pot. Now there are other names for it. Some people call it a, a salad or whatever they call it. But we are allowing people in America to be themselves and not expecting everyone to be the same. And that's what I'm hoping is going to happen from day.